Welcome to TCT Alive. My name is Paul Kendall. I'm the family pastor at Winston-Salem First in beautiful North Carolina, and I am especially excited about this program. I actually volunteered for this because we have a guest today that's going to help us tackle a huge issue, addiction. My guess is that you or someone that you know has been touched by addiction, and this is a program that you really need to listen closely to. I would even encourage you to pick up a pad and a pen and jot some things down because this program really could make a huge difference in that person's life. We have with us none other than Jeff Van Bondren. You may know him from the A&E award-winning program called Intervention. You may have also seen him on Oprah, but he is top of the list in my book when it comes to this subject. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to getting into that subject with him today. We also have some special music, and I think this is just going to be an exceptional program. So I don't want to wait another minute. I want to get talking to this guy. So would you join me in welcoming Jeff Van Bondren? Thank you. Good to have you on the program. Glad to be here. Well, there's so many questions I have for you. We're probably not going to have time for all of them. But before I get to the addiction stuff... Tell us a little bit about Jeff Van Vonderen and how you came to know the Lord. Well, I grew up in a small community in northern Wisconsin and uh, went to a Baptist church. And it was one of three Baptist churches, which were three of seven churches in a town of 200 people. And um, it was First Baptist and uh, very legalistic. You know, I... I I, I gave my life to the Lord so many times mm, yeah. you know, because it was expected of me. My grandmother even told me what to say for my testimony when I got <laughs> baptized. I mean, yeah. Sure. So I, I pretty much learned how to be the best good guy you could be because that's, that's what paid. You know. But that, none of that was on the inside. So then when I got some power in my life called a driver's license and a mm. high school diploma, yeah. I basically went off the deep end. And then I was going to be the best bad guy I could be, which, of course, uh, I burned out of that quick, more quickly because now you have cops after you and you know, stuff like that instead of everybody praising you. Yeah. All right, so I, I pretty much, uh, the answer to your question was, I think, when I was 20 years old, you know, and I have realized that being the, being the best guy didn't work, being the worst guy didn't work, and I was empty on the inside. And, you know, I, I ended up going to a Christian college, which was another one of my geographical escapes from all my problems because, again, I thought my problems are outside of me, not inside of me. But that's where I saw people that loved Jesus, and it was, just was about loving Jesus and, I guess, letting him love you back and that's when I, I think I really became a, a Christian yeah well I know from there you went on to pastor you became a counselor <clears throat> and then somehow you end up in this area of specialty uh, in the area of addiction and it's such a huge problem I think it's probably bigger than we even know it's big what we know about but I think it's probably even bigger how did you end up in that area of specialty my last year of seminary you know, I was I was training a seminary to kind of be, I, I guess, a New Testament teacher mm -hmm. kind of guy, you know. And I was taking pastoral care courses and things like that, which interested me in some internships and stuff. But I was doing New Testament Greek. I mean, that was what I cared about and whatever. Um, so I, my last year of seminary, I needed a job mm. <laughs> just to get me, you know, pay the bills. And... Uh, I knew a guy whose son I had helped when I was working as a junior high pastor who um, knew I needed a job. You know, he was a bank president, actually, and he knew I needed a job, and he offered me a job to re-file all of his files. His filing system at the bank was like open the drawer, stuff something in, you know. Right. And he wanted all that organized, and he thought it would take the whole year. Yeah. And I did it in about six months, uh, six weeks, six, mm. <laughs> and then I needed a job. There's a brand new treatment center opening up and um, no clients just built and they needed support staff like cooks and maintenance or direct care staff like technicians and you know and um, I went and applied to be a technician and I got that job for my last year but when I when I once I was there 
uh, it was very clear to me that this is what I was going to do. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to go back to, you know, being a New Testament teacher. This is what I was. These are these are my people. Mm -hmm. That's that's how it felt. Right. And it felt like um, it, when I said things, it made sense to them. Yeah. They resonated with what I was saying. Uh, had you, know, you had your formal training in counseling before that, or yes. was it a result of that? Yeah, no. Well, <laughs> I will say that I didn't learn much before that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, then when I got certified as a chemical dependency practitioner in, uh, in my home state, and then you have to have continuing education credits to keep that up. So okay. I, I probably have 500, you know... And this was in family systems and prevention and, uh, abu you know, sexual abuse recovery and, okay. you know, from all over the place, University of Utah School in Alcoholism, you know, the University of Minnesota, different workshops and stuff. So through the course, that's where I learned, that's where I learned things, you know. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was in a different mode then than I was when I was in school because, you know, in school, a lot of times you learn stuff because you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And but now I was learning it because I wanted to, and you know, so that's how I got in the field. Right. And uh, that was 1978, and I've been in the field ever since. Right. Well, it's been my experience from having um, people very close to me became addicted to substances that it was really tough for me to understand. As a matter of fact, I was angry at them most of the time, and it seemed like my anger didn't really help any. If anything, it just distanced us for a while, and then I'd want to rush in and, and, and be the savior and help them, and then that would just be a cycle that would repeat. I could never understand what was going on. But what's going on in the mind of an addict? Well, see, the thing about addiction is that um, it doesn't uh, uh, discriminate. So it's not about social class. It's not about you know religion. In fact... I mean, I've been trying to smuggle recovery into the church for yeah. 30, 35 years because mm -hmm. the church is a tough audience. And my experience is, and this doesn't go across the board, but my experience is that the church would rather argue about uh, how the person got there mm. than what are we going to do to help them once they're there. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's a big debate about whether it's a sin or a sickness and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and that's one of the obstacles. You know, now if you define sin with the Greek word hamartia, which means missing the mark, then you can say that addiction is a sin because addiction misses God's mark for drinking. Okay. okay. There's a certain mark where you don't break laws, you don't hurt people, you don't, you know, if you miss that mark, addiction would qualify for that. I see. Okay. Um, so I don't want to have that argument, you know, mm -hmm. or the argument about how the person got here. You know, you know, you have children. When one of them was five years old and you said, you know, don't go play on the road, you could get, get hit by a car. Mm -hmm. If they did anyway, you wouldn't go out there and look at them and go, I wonder if it was a Dodger or Chevy. Right. I mean, who cares? <laughs> right. It just happened. You, you know, did they come out the front door? Did they come out the garage door? You wouldn't mm -hmm. point at your wife and say, I told you to lock the door. Right. You'd say, there are people that deal with this. Let's... Get them there. And mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe they need to figure out why the guy keeps going on the road all the time in front right. of cars. But that's not helpful at this point. Mm -hmm. I think that addiction is as rampant in the church as it is in society. I believe it. I think that uh, prohibitions against drinking or, or whatever don't work, mm -hmm. you know. So, for instance, in churches that are, have, a, I would say, a liberal view of drinking, for instance. Right. As adults, 90% plus people choose to drink at some point or another. What, 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 what percentage? Nine, 90. 90%. 90%. Okay, wow. and out of the 90%, 10% or so become addicted, which means that out of 100% of all the people in those churches, 10%. 10 right, okay. okay. In conservative churches that have prohibitions against drinking, it's a sin to drink, or you shouldn't drink, or it's wrong to drink. Okay, fifty percent of adults still choose to drink anyway, and out of those fifty percent, twenty percent become addicted. So out of the hundred percent, it's still ten percent. Yeah, still ten percent. So it's the same in either church. Yes, and what an opportunity! I think that the church has even a more unique opportunity than lots of helping agencies because the clergy person is the only person. In society, the only helping professional, lawyers, doctors, psychiatrists, social workers, you know, that can come to your door, knock on it, you know who they are, and you'll let them in. So what if that person 
was trained or equipped in the area of understanding family systems and addiction and child abuse. Wow. And, you know, I mean, but they're not. Right. They're not. Well, and people can't, uh, I shouldn't say it across the board, but I know, it, at least in my experience <coughs> in the churches I've grown up in and been in, you can't even admit that you drink. That, you got to hide that. Well, okay, so, so back to where I grew up. Okay, we had this thing called testimony time. Yeah. Okay, testimony time was Sunday nights. And testimony time looked to me, like felt to me even back then, and I wasn't, you know, really understanding a lot back then. I was just following the crowd, you know, like a lemming. But um, I, it felt to me like it was kind of a can you beat this blessing time. Right. Where people would stand up and say the cooler, neater thing God did from, for them than the last person said it did for them. And if you didn't have a cool thing, you just shut up. Mm. Well, the word testimony is a legal term, mm-hmm. and it's what, it's what witnesses do. They testify. Right. And when a witness testifies, they talk about what they experienced or saw. Okay. So if they embellish that or change that, that's called perjury. It's against the law. Mm-hmm. So you just stand up and say, here's what I experienced. Okay. So what if your testimony during testimony time was, um, I'm a mess. I don't even know if there's a God. I'm really struggling with smoking or with drinking or I'm really, it's, you know, and if God doesn't show up somehow and make himself known to me, I'm going to give up. I'll go right down the toilet if that doesn't happen. Thank you very much. That's my testimony. See, mm-hmm. well, that wouldn't fly in where I no. grew up and in a lot of churches. But my point is, what if you actually could get up during testimony time and say that? See, if you actually could get up and say that and it was okay, mm-hmm. then God, who is faithful, he is faithful. He's going to step in there because he cares about us. He loves us. And, you know, he's worried about our well-being and our struggles and stuff. Okay, so God, who is faithful, is going to step up at some point. Mm -hmm. And then everybody who's watching, well, then they can see God do his own good public relations for himself. Instead of we as Christians thinking that we have to make good PR for God based on how Christians don't have problems. Mm, Wow. Wow. And that's why a lot of people in the world, whoever that is, think we're phonies. Right. Because, you know, Monday through Saturday, we struggle with real stuff, and Sunday, life is grand, and we're hap, hap, happy all the day. Right. You know. So the deal is changing that culture in church to where church is a safe place to admit the struggles that you're having and, and seek legitimate help. Right. And it's about you know, where the truth is more important than how things look. Mm-hmm. Because if, you're, if you go to a church or you're in a family where how things look is more important than what, what's real, right. what's real will not get dealt with. Mm-hmm. It will not get dealt with. Yeah. Now, now, as far as addiction goes, what people don't understand about addiction, some basic kinds of things. For instance, when a person gets addicted to a substance, the substance could be heroin or or alcohol, or whatever. Those are substance addictions. Their body becomes accustomed to it. Then they need more of it to get the same effect. That's called tolerance, and they get a signal from their body, where is it, called withdrawal, if they don't have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The most dangerous withdrawal is alcohol and, I would say, benzos. That would be Xanax or whatever. So now, you know, you can kill you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Heroin, people think heroin is. Because they've seen heroin movies where, you know, the person's climbing the walls or whatever. The thing about opiate withdrawal is um, it might hurt more than alcohol withdrawal. You know, it might hurt so bad you jump out the window because you can't stand it. But it's not the absence of opiates that kill you. It's jumping out the window. Right. But with alcohol, the abs- if you're addicted to alcohol, the absence of alcohol could kill you. You could have a seizure. You could stop breathing. I mean, on and on. Right. Okay? Um, so now imagine the millions of people in the church and not in the church, just in society, with a loved one who, if they keep drinking, it could kill them. And if they stop drinking, it could kill them. And yet the only help they're trying to give that person is putting all kinds of pressure on them to try to get them to stop drinking. Mm. You know? So if the person does do that, stop drinking, they, you know, if they're severely addicted to alcohol, it puts them in imminent life-threatening danger, for one thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, But the other thing is that, let's say they even mean it. They say, fine, you know, um, I won't, I'll stop drinking. Let's say they actually do it, stop drinking. Well, what happens then, and they could even mean it, 
So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They're not just saying that to get people off their case. Mm -hmm. At some point, their physiological need for the substance becomes stronger than their willpower not to use it, and then they start drinking again, and everybody's all disappointed. No one more than themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. now, but there's another aspect of addiction that people don't understand, because sometimes people get addicted to the substance, right? mood-altering substance, but right. sometimes people get addicted to mood-altering, period. Mm. Just the phenomenon of mood-altering. Mm -hmm. That's why you could lose your family over gambling. Yeah. That's what, these are called process addictions. You know, you get addicted to a phenomenon. Right. Um, and, uh, or you could, or sex addiction, or workaholism, or whatever, and even church addiction. So is the root of addiction, no matter how it crops up, sex addiction, addiction alcohol, hair, and whatever, is the root of it the same? Well, I think it is. You know, the, but, you know, we, you, you said the root, which is like this, and I'd say the root is a little bit bigger than that, you know. Right. But, but um, yeah, it, I think the root is a painful sense of self, you know. Okay. And, and how much does the church have to say to, to that issue? Mm -hmm. If there is, um, it, it, the good news is, in Christ we have a new identity, I, I, I want to touch on the cycle of addiction for those of you that either addicted or those of you that are trying to deal with people, loved ones that are addicted. So, Jeff, help us understand that once a person crosses that line, they, they use whatever for the first time. And from there, it's down the slippery slope. What what's happening? Well, it's just that they start choosing to medicate instead of facing issues and solving problems for real. So, for instance, I, I, when I get called to do an intervention or get called to help somebody, th these are not people that are bad guys. Right. Okay. I mean, whether they're believers or not, that's a different topic, but they're not bad guys. People don't call me to help bad guys. They say, they're a bad guy. We've, we're done. Right. You know? If you had a conversation with them the year before the addiction started and predicted the next five years, ten years. Pretty good. Here's what your life is going to look like, Paul. Here's the compromises you're going to make. Here is the people you're going to hurt. Here's the lies you're going to tell. Here's what you're going to do to your body. Here's the laws you're going to break. Okay. They wouldn't believe it. Right. They wouldn't believe it. You know, the family is looking at them going, I can't believe it. The, the person himself wouldn't believe it. Right. Which means they're living inconsistent with their value system, which is even, I want to say worse, but more it's even worse mm. if you're a believer because yeah. now you have God inside of you, you know, and it just says you're living in conflict. Right. But see, the difference is that if you do something inconsistent with your value system, you feel bad and fix it. Okay? Yeah. When an addict feels bad and medicates it. Oh, okay. So, so the, the hole keeps getting deeper, plus feeling bad doesn't help. That's, that's huge to me because that is the turmoil that has gone on in my life when I was doing behaviors that were inconsistent with God's word. That's the difference between the bad guy that doesn't even come for counseling because he doesn't care. That's the difference between the bad guy and the, the guy that, like you said, is a good guy, but he's, he's even tormented by his own behavior. Yes. Th that's the difference because yes. it's what? Inconsistent with <clears throat> our... Valley system. Okay. With our heart. And, and the thing is that, that pursuing things that are addictive as the solution to problems, you know, if I was to put that in spiritual terms, that's, that's relying on a false god. False gods are things that promise but don't deliver. Mm -hmm. okay? So if you rely on something or someone to meet your needs that can't do it, mm -hmm. that's a false god. If you rely on the real god to do that, he promises to do it and he, he doesn't. So in Isaiah 57 it says, you were tired out by the length of your road, which, you know, is what happens when you are addicted. It's mm -hmm. exhausting to do it. It gets you nowhere, you know. But you don't notice that because you're medicated. Okay. You were tired out by the length of your road, yet you did not say it's hopeless. So you didn't give up, though. You didn't go, wow, this isn't working. I'll try something else. Okay. Um, but, but you're not saying it's hopeless. You found renewed strength. You, you kicked it up a notch. Therefore, you did not faint. Of whom were you fearful and worried and didn't remember me? Mm. The real God. Yeah. Was I not even silent for a long time? Still, you do not fear me. So, in other words, you were so busy chasing your false stuff mm -hmm. that I went someplace else. Yeah. Bye. Right. And you were so busy, you didn't even notice I was gone. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I've done that in the, in ministry. Mm -hmm. Getting so busy doing God's stuff that he said, I, I, I'm not part of this, bye. And I didn't notice because I was doing God's stuff. You know, so, so what do you do when somebody argues that they must have the false God? Well, they, let me finish the verse. Okay. okay? Uh, but you know, I say it's hopeless. You found renewed strength. I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, which means I'm going to just take all your right. He doesn't say unrighteousness, okay. even your righteousness. Put it up on a billboard, post it so everybody can see it, especially you. Mm -hmm. I will... Declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. When you cry out, okay, when you finally get to the end, when you cry out, let your collection of idols save you. Mm. Yeah, it's brutal. But he who takes refuge in me shall inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. So, you know, if you're, if you're a cocaine addict and you still want to be a cocaine addict, well, then maybe you should just try using a bunch more cocaine until you figure out cocaine is... When you finally cry out and hit bottom and end up in prison, let your cocaine save you. Wow. You know, if you think that sexual addiction is going to, you know, be sleeping around and all that, well, just have a bunch more affairs. And, you know, the, the, the problem and the beauty of false gods is they're false. Wow, wow. So I'm just getting started. I know only the one true God can bring promises and deliver fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Wow! Well, now you've written the flesh extensive. is the flesh is weak and the spirit is not right. Wow! You've written extensively on this, and one book is good news for the chemically dependent and those who love them. Uh, this is one of Jeff's books, and uh, we have another one here. Tired of trying to measure up. Uh, getting free from the demands, expectations, and intimidation, intimidation of well-meaning people. Listen, you have got to get a hold of these resources. And um, uh, we're going to put a web address up on the screen. Uh, Jeff, tell people how they can get a hold of you. Well, you can go on my website and get an email address or my phone number, but I think that's on, right the, on the screen. screen. Yeah. Uh, you can re email me if you want, uh, jvx2, like jv times 2 mm -hmm. at AOL.com. All right, and your books are available on your website yeah. and on Amazon. Yeah, Barnes & Noble. All right, listen, take advantage of these resources and get the help that you need. I'm so happy that you've been able to be on the program with us today. Thank you. And uh, I'm so grateful for a network like TCT that brings you good, helpful information like this. And I want to encourage you to support Christian television. It's made possible by your support. Now, you've got things to work on. I hope that you will pray and ask God how to put these things to work in your life. God bless you.